uh, the Julian Shear term professor of the School of Journalism and MassCom. Uh, Lucille works in the area of international communication. She's a fellow, uh, fellow traveler in qualitative methods, um, as well as a, a, a proponent of the best, I think, of critical theory as well, and thinking about sort of how we can challenge assumptions that we have um, and the role of communication in social life and trades in the uh, areas of social justice and race, normative theory, ethnicity, class, and, and gender. Um, uh, she's the author of uh, three books, Social Uses and Radio Practices, Women, Faculty of Color in the White Classroom and Latina Teens, Migration and Popular Culture. Um, she also directs the Latino Journalism and Media uh, Project, uh, Lefty Jam, uh, which I do have to say I have the honor to have been able to go see the newsroom. Uh, my wife oh, was a guest radio. on the mm -hmm. show, and it is awesome. There's all these high school kids uh, who, I mean, it's just this bubbling, vibrant, lively uh, nice. place. Uh, where the kids literally are having amazing fun. And my wife had an amazing time being on it uh, and uh, just really had a great time uh, and couldn't say enough about the wonderful work that you're doing in the community uh, here in addition to your scholarship. So with that, I will turn thank it over you. to you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm not sure that's really me, but anyway. <laughs> It sounds so good, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> OK, um, this is some research that um, I have been doing for a number of years. So several students have participated on this. Uh, one of them is uh, Joseph Erba, who was my PhD student here before. And uh, we actually um, wrote a paper, submitted a paper to ICA based on this. Uh -huh. So thank you for being here and for allowing me to rehearse for ICA in case <laughs> my paper is accepted. And another student who is a first year master's student, but he is um, Ryan Comfort. He's my TA, and he has been fantastic uh, in terms of um, just getting into the research and being very committed to it. So I want to thank them, of course. Uh, two other students that I don't have the names here who also helped me to do some of the data collection were Anasa Senegal and also, also Ma Michael Fulhesh. Michael finished a few years ago. Okay, and so the first <coughs> claim, the first claim that um, I'm making here is uh, the importance of studying the region when we study Latino media. Because previous research, in previous research, to begin with, there is not a lot of research on Latino media. Uh, and by Latino media, I mean Spanish language media, bilingual media, and English language media, the three of them. Uh, but it's, um, the definition is um, media that is catering to Latinos. So it doesn't have to do with uh, Latino ownership, but just catering to Latinos. So in the small body of research that we have, we have studies, for example, of Univision, big studies, national, so the national media, or the transnational connections of Univision with Televisa. Or we have case studies, studies of newspapers or studies of, of Univision, uh -huh. um, or more Texas media, maybe. But we haven't paid enough attention to the, to the regional. And if we consider that, yes, in terms of the Spanish language media catering to Latinos, um, it is the second largest market in the world, so only after Mexico. So it's a huge thing, and there are huge differences among Latinos and among these regions. Another thing is that this media has been previously examined as ethnic media or minority media. So very often it's uh, uh, grouped together, for example, with um, African American media or Native American media. And it's very different. The experience is very, very different. So I'm criticizing this paradigm or using this paradigm of the, of the um, ethnic media. And I will tell you why in a minute. Um, this, is, this was the population of the United States in 1980 in terms <coughs> of the Latino population. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the regional media, of course. In the, in the southeast, our region. And, and you can see that there were practically very, very, very few 
spots there, blue spots. And then if you go to the 1990, you start to see a little bit more, but to the 2000 and then very dramatic in 2006. So uh, if you do it, uh, if we do it again, you can see how, how dramatic the, the, uh, the change was. Uh -huh. So what, I'm, what my argument is that this, the media in this region are really, really different from the media in other regions. Um, so we started this research for two, for two reasons. One is uh, media, media catering to Latinos starting to come about. Mm -hmm. And there is a need to document, just to document the history of it and just to map it. And also there was another need um, that it has to do more with uh, engagement and it's uh, creating a, a directory, a directory of this media, especially for non-profit organizations and even for government, uh, government agencies, for uh, uh, service providers to this community. Because there are many, many directories, of course, but you have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> So we created, uh, we created a, a directory. I will show you a little bit about the directory. And maybe I do it now. Um, this is the Latijan website, if you are not uh, familiar with. And then here on the, on the research, um, it goes to the regional directory. We don't have the 2012 there because we don't have the funding to do it. Uh, but anyway, you can you can search all the radio stations in one particular particular state. Mm. It's for every state. And for every state in the New Latino South, it's a regional directory, and I will tell you there are six states. Um, why does it go like this? Uh, So here are the here are the here are the states. Um, there was also there's also the problem of how you define how do you define the region, uh, and uh, a lot of research has included other other states here, uh, but uh, like Mississippi for example or Louisiana, um, but the change in these states was not as dramatic, and there were two kinds of changes. So one is the Latino settlement. And also, the other is um, a restructuring, an economic and political restructuring of the, of the South. So the Latino Central was just part of it. Mm -hmm. And these six states, according to study of the Pew Hispanic Center, and I'm taking their lead there, um, share similar characteristics. Mm, so one, one way to look at it is by, by looking at the, the political divisions. Mm -hmm. But another way is by looking at the, um, at the markets, because this is an industry, right? Uh, it's by looking at the markets, and the, the, best, the best data is based on radio. Mm -hmm. By the way, Latino, Latino radio, uh, radio is the most important medium for Latinos. So it's probably, Arbitron is the one that captures better this population, mm -hmm, this market. It's almost, it's like a, a million less, if you see, is the metro, um, 12 plus population. Uh, and um, so with the, with the media directory, we did four years from 2009 to 2012, and it's the data that we have. Uh, we look at newspapers, radio and TV stations, and then uh, with the um, data material that we collected, so we collected data, <laughs> from uh, specialized uh, uh, directories, all kinds of directories. Uh, um, then uh, we um, contacted the, the uh, media companies, especially the newspapers. This is what I'm going to focus on, the newspapers. We contacted them by, e by email or by, by phone. Then we also did, for more of the history, um, searching at uh, the um, newspapers, uh, newspaper database, database, U.S. Bank, searching for all the mentions of the mainstream media, of the Latino media, which we didn't find that many, but we found a few. Mm -hmm. um, then why newspapers, if this radio is the most important medium for Latinos? Well, newspapers, because it is a doable project. 
in a short period of time, I can actually do it, right? <laughs> Rather than the radio in which there are over a hundred radio stations. It's very, very difficult to find information about, about uh, um, this media. It's not very easy. So I didn't, I didn't know, of course, what I was getting into it. Um, the second reason is that the newspapers, of course, are crucial for uh, the political and, and civic life for communities. Uh, and there is research showing that um, the readers of Spanish language newspapers tend to, of course, um, participate more in political life and civic life. Mm -hmm. uh, not surprising, right? It's yes, the research on newspapers has shown that. Uh, and they are also important for producing or reproducing community, what uh, geographers, we have a geographer here, call place-making, place right? On place-making processes. Uh -huh. um, another reason is that it just happened to be that the newspapers that I studied, the newspapers in this region, uh, are pretty good papers in terms of, in com com comparing them with the counterparts in other regions. So they just won, uh, these three local newspapers, they just won the, almost all the, all the, all the awards <coughs> in their category. They are uh, under 30,000, that's what it is, under 30,000 in terms of c circulation. It's very difficult to ascertain circulation because only um, seven of the newspapers of the 20, 29 newspapers that we found get their circulation audited, independently audited, because you have to pay for it, of course. Uh -huh. So there's another another thing that is, is hard to, so to do it. This is the national award of the, uh, the National Association of Hispanic Newspapers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the national award. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> neither, neither did I. <laughs> yeah, but you, you will not, you will not say it. Like I said, the, the mainstream media is, doesn't, do not do a very good job in terms of covering this media. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, one thing is that I thought, okay, I'm going to do some kind of, um, this some kind of economic analysis. So describing the structure of the industry. Mm -hmm. But then it doesn't really make sense because there are so many non-economic factors that you have to take into account uh, to analyze this media. Uh, among those economic factors are, um, one is related to the fact that uh, most of the media constituencies, not only the, the readers, but also the writers, the editors, the uh, publishers, the owners, uh, most of them will be immigrant. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came to this, uh, to this <coughs> conclusion of using uh, car <coughs> Polani. In Spanish, you say Polangi. How do you say it, Alta? You don't know? Polani, uh -huh. Polani, I think. He was Hungarian, he was Hungarian. And uh, he was uh, publishing in the 50s, actually. Um, it's a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, we don't know that much because he criticizes uh, liberal economics, market economics. Mm -hmm. But it's quite interesting. He was an economic historian, more than anything. So his main, main uh, uh, idea is that in liberal economics, you have the economics are kind of disembedded from the social, so they are kind of abstract things, right? The markets are kind of floating, uh -huh, but they are not rooted in the social. And so his idea is, is this is not possible. Economic life is social life. It is, so the, all the economic uh, uh, phenomena, processes, activity, economic activity is part of social life. So it's part of the social. That's the, the main thing. So it is embedded. So economic activity is embedded and embedded. Mm, and mesh in the social. Uh, the other is um, 
what are the non-economic factors? When I when I think on on this um, Polanyi's theory, I can think on the non-economic factors, right? I can include the non-economic factors. So one is obviously the restructuring of the new Latino South of these six states. It, it didn't happen just because it happened, right? It was part of a, of a global project. It was part of, of the neoliberal project. And uh, of course, the, the neoliberal ideas uh, play very well in the South. And part of that project, one of the effects of that project, NAFTA, for example, is part of that project. That's the most important thing. Uh, yeah, the opening of borders, pretty much globalization, economic globalization and political globalization. Um, but part of, the, of those processes uh, was the linking of the labor market of this region with the labor market of Mexico. That was, so there was making just one, in some way, like one market, right? Mm -hmm. Or making, making very easy. So that was part of why Latinos came here. Without that, uh, that was uh, one. The other was immigration policies. The immigration policies that had been, and the enforcement of the immigration policies, that have been very flexible. Mm -hmm. I would say very flexible for the, um, the employment of um, workers whose um, labor is made cheap. This is, this is from Cynthia Enloth that criticizes the word cheap labor. She said we should say labor made cheap. Made cheap, oh, made yeah. cheap right. Uh -huh. Um, and both of those are political decisions. That doesn't have to do with economics at all. It has to do with, with politics. Uh -huh. uh, then the anti-immigrant climate and the local enforcement, which is more recent. So in the, in the late 90s, um, even early 2000s, um, there was a more accommodating environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there was a national anti-immigrant anti -immigrant sentiment in general. And of course, North Carolina is uh, the uh, state when uh, laws like the um, 287G, local laws, local ordinances. Mm -hmm. uh, What's 287G? 287G is a local, is. It's a local ordinance uh, that is adapted by counties, uh, and basically is, it gives um, um, law enforcement um, the um, permission to ask to stop anyone who they have the suspicion of being Latinos. What else, Alta? Secure communities. Secure communities. That's another one. Programs allow local police to, to work with federal enforcement and to stop people just because they suspect they might not have papers and so and yeah. deport them. Like that's that. not their explicit goal, but that's how it works. That's the effect. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Immigra immigration uh, policy and enforcement has been a federal, a federal issue, uh -huh. not, not a state or local issue. So those are local and gives the, the local police, the local enforcement um, agencies. And that's still in flux, right? Like Alabama yeah. was the state recently. Yeah, Alabama is also. Mm -hmm. Having stricter policies than what federal law, and so in the Attorney General, or is it it's just Arizona, where the, sta the federal is trying to say, no, states can't do something to usurp our power to deal with immigration policy. It's political. Uh, just a mess, just a mess. Uh -huh. well, uh -huh. uh -huh. Sheriff's deputies, if you have 287G, they are federalized and they can um, use their jails as federal facilities. Right, right. That's, an, that's, that's another way. Federal prisoners and find them over to ICE. Mm -hmm. So the, the effect is that it's become very restrictive, very, very restrictive for. Uh, um, Latinos in general, because it is supposed to be for undocumented Latinos, but then it's, it's actually uh, 
I mean, how do you know that I'm documented or undocumented? Hello. You couldn't find the, the room. Yes, I admire. Other people help. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh -huh. So it just makes very difficult. It just makes very difficult uh, um, everyday living. There is one, one geographer also who analyzes Atlanta, and she argues that all these restrictions restrict space. So there is a driver license. Uh -huh. So you cannot you cannot move. So it's a restriction of space. It's a restriction of of work spaces. Mm -hmm. So how it limited spaces. Um, and the other is for Latinos. Latinos, it's not. You cannot say that it's a class interest. So it is a particular interest mm -hmm. uh, that we have based on on. Um, how are the people coming late? Yeah, he's here. <laughs> so difficult to find this place. Yeah. Hello. Some reporters, I see. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, Did I did I do this? In terms of Latinos, Latinos particular interest, um, the me, the ethnic media, like I said before, Latino media has been studied as ethnic media, and there are some functions of um, of the ethnic media. Among those functions are um, the creation of safe spaces. Uh, for example, the um, reproducing of cultural traditions, for example. And so there are some specific functions to the ethnic media that are different from the general market media. So just the reproduction of, of the language, for example, will be that. So a lot of them are for uh, cultural reproduction. Uh, the other are, um, of course, informing, informing communities that are neglected by the general market media. Mm. So these are particular, right, to, to Latinos. Um, I mentioned before uh, Polanyi, right, that he talks about, so it gives me this framework to I incorporate all these economic, these economic uh, factors, non-economic factors into the analysis. He talks about how, like I say, he criticizes uh, liberal economics, market economics, but he also criticizes Marxism. He criticizes Marxism because of the class. He said, it is not class what moves groups of people. More often, what moves groups of people into social movements, it is sectional interest. Sectional? Sectional. He calls it sectional interest. Sectional. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. In terms of interest, in terms of interest. So, for example, the the Latino interest are sectional interest. Can you give me an example of a Latino interest that wouldn't be an interest for another group, maybe? Uh, well, uh, immigration is one. But that is it, it's not a. It's, Latino, but it wouldn't be exclusively. No, it's not exclusively. What would be an example that is? Exclusively Latino. The, the teaching of Spanish, the teaching of Spanish bilingual education. Mm -hmm. Or I could see something that would be exclusively Cuban, maybe just opening up Cuba, you know, and tra uh, traveling right. to Cuba. Right. Okay, uh -huh. so sectional uh -huh. interest. Sectional interest. Um, from class. In terms of um, internet research, they talk about communities of interest. Yeah, what they, when you form networks that are according to one interest, and the interest could be astronomy, right? Or could be anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Poker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a small. But uh, he was talking about a little bit broader, a little bit broader. So, for example, youth movements. 
that are not, you cannot explain them just using class. Mm -hmm. uh, the women's movement, of course, is related to middle class women, right? But you cannot explain it just because it is, where it was, it was not class oppression. Where it was, it was um, patriarchy, patriarchal oppression, right? Uh -huh. Discrimination is another one. That is, that is a sectional interest for Latinos, not exclusively for Latinos, right, yeah, for many different groups. Uh, you, you study, you study uh, uh, GLBT. Mm -hmm. can, you see, can you see sectional interest there? Definitely. Yeah? Uh, uh -huh. I could uh -huh. see marriage rights could be something that yeah? uh -huh. isn't necessarily promised, uh -huh. much more so in this case, uh -huh. sexual orientation, gender. Uh -huh. um, he talks about how often it is the sectional interests are, those interests also are not economic interests necessarily, right? Or not only economic, but are social. It's because of social motives, the need for recognition. So this is group identity. It's all about identity. It is group identity, of course. It is group identity. He doesn't talk that much about talk, the identity because it was not his not what he was trying to explain. Uh -huh. But I'll, what he was trying to explain is how economic phenomena, right? Economic activity, it is not necessarily linked to a self-interest, to an economic self-interest, right? That economic activity may be moved by, that it's often moved by, by social motives. Mm -hmm. And this applies to the to the um, Latino media. Um, I'm going to to go to the next one, and, and it will <coughs> I will explain it. Um, I also like Polanyi because it is uh, it's a historian, right? And historians, like ethnographers, want to do everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, we want to get uh, material from every place that we can get it. Uh -huh. So he has a, a, a methodological approach that he considers the totality. So it's a holistic. So it is considered the totality, rather than separating elements, right? Rather than separating the economic only from the social, but considering it all. Um, and considering the interrelationship between different sets of phenomena. Um, and uses empirical material. Mm -hmm from every place, various fields and through various methods. Okay, the media directory that we did. Mm -hmm. It is from 2009 to 2011. Um, uh, and I have, it's actually from 2009 to 2012. But I'm showing you here what we, the data that we collected um, in three years, because if you see the big change, especially for newspapers, it was in 2010. So it went from, you see the total, the column of the total? In newspapers it went to 39 to 29. Today is 29. Radio actually did better, but then it is worse. So the comparison between the whole period, 2009 to 2011, um, you can see the 39 to the 29. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the red is trying to signify that uh, there are less, less newspapers than it was before. Uh -huh. So you can see all red, <laughs> right? <laughs> really. uh, this period is uh, a post-economic crisis period, right? because the recession is supposed to have finished in, in the mid-2009 when we started collecting data. Um, this is the, the, another way of presenting the same data, just an, an easier way of presenting the same data. Um, the number of media outlets and uh, the newspapers, 26 percent. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to focus just on newspapers. 
where she's supposed to be. Uh, so this is the same, the same data that I showed you before. It's just having just, just the newspaper, so you can see a little bit better. Uh, you can see, for example, Tennessee. How's the same? It didn't, it didn't change. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean that are the same newspapers. It's the same, the same number of newspapers. Uh -huh. It's the same number of newspapers, not necessarily the same newspaper. It may be that one newspaper closed and another open, and then you have four again. Uh, but so many in North Carolina. Oh. So many, North Carolina, yeah, North Carolina and Georgia. Uh -huh. But of course, when you have the biggest markets and you have the, the largest population, Right, so it, it makes sense in, in that in that sense. Um, we are dividing these newspapers, and I think you can divide all the Latino media in this in these three types. And it is one is um, independent companies, just businesses, just businesses. So you have a, a for example, um, Northsan, the Northsan Group here uh, in North Carolina. The owner is Norberto Sanchez and um, originally from, from uh, Florida. Um, at least it was when he started the first, uh, his first business. And he has all kind of business, a lot of business related to food. So he started with restaurants and food processing. So it's like someone who was doing something else and then they started to have interest in, uh, in media. Mm -hmm. Um, their main interest is uh, is a business. He's a businessman, right? So that's their, ma their main interest. And then you have also um, the um, papers published by general market um, papers, like for example the um, the Durham. What is the name? <coughs> the Durham Herald. The Durham. What is the Herald Sun? The Herald Sun. The Herald Sun published for a while and. Uh, a weekly newspaper called Nuestro Pueblo. Uh -huh. Most of this, most of this, uh, um, sometimes there were inserts or were columns in Spanish. Most of them didn't survive. As far as I know, there is there are only two um, in the in the region that have survived. So initially they saw an economic opportunity, but it didn't really pan out for them. Then you have another very different, the other extreme, the other extreme, which are newspapers started for uh, not uh, for because you are a, a business person and you are looking to have a um, a good enterprise, but because you are motivated by social justice, you are motivated by social justice. So it has to do. This is a totally alternative media, in that <coughs> sense. Um, you tend to be small newspapers, smaller newspapers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that most of the newspapers and most of the, most of the media in the United States, except for the big media, uh, like Univision, um, are in the middle. So they are for profit, advertising based, but they are very strongly advocacy media. Mm -hmm. uh, I would venture to say that all Latino media are advocacy media in some way. Uh -huh. Some more than others, right? Um, in the last, uh, the last, uh, um, the last year, 1912, we also look at the, how they are using, uh, using the internet, the newspapers, and how they are using social media. And uh, out of the 29, only one newspaper doesn't, doesn't have a website at all. It's a very small newspaper. Uh, and then another one has a newspaper, but it's a very uh, basic news, uh, a website, but it's a very basic website. And the rest of them, uh, of the ones that we found, uh -huh, have um, online, have, have an online presence, have an online newspaper of some kind. Some of them are excellent. Mm. So the major trends, and I'm, I'm going to finish pretty soon, the major trends are the newspaper industry in the region 
uh, has consolidated, and you can see very clearly two groups, the Kepasa group and the Northern group, uh, and both of them are based in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte is, a, is like the hub. Uh -huh. Raleigh is very important, but Charlotte is like pretty much the, the hub. Not Atlanta, that you will say, why is not Atlanta? Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, I found some, some evidence. Uh, um, actually, Norberto Sanchez was the one saying that people in Charlotte, Latinos in Charlotte, organize themselves. And they talk to each other, and it's more like a community than in Atlanta. That in Atlanta, people, it's more dispersed, the community. So it may have to be, it may have to do with that. Uh, um, but at the same time, even, <coughs> even though it has consolidated, there is some room for competition. And recently, uh, another player uh, from um, Charlotte, he just moved into Raleigh, which is the turf of Kepasa. Uh -huh. So there is a new, a new paper, La Noticia. Uh -huh. uh, of course, they have been publishing the, the Charlotte edition for, for years. But they just started the Raleigh edition. Uh, At the beginning of the newspapers, and by the way, the oldest newspaper was 1979 in Atlanta. But it's a rare. It is it's a still it's a still published, and it's a very good paper. Uh -huh. uh, the online the online uh, uh, edition is very slick, and it has a lot of local information. Mm. But most of these papers appear in the early 90s. I will say, started to appear in the, in the early 90s. Mm, and most of the social justice papers ap appear at that time. But there are still, there are still many of them. They are still surviving. Um, nearly all of the newspapers that we study are owned and operated by Latinos, which is a very interesting and very different from the national scene. Uh, even, for example, uh, La Opinión, which is uh, Los Angeles. Uh, is uh, the most important, probably, the, I, I would say the most important Latino newspaper, other people would say it's the Miami Herald, but for me it's La Opinion. Um, it's more advocacy, uh, La Opinion. Well, I would say more to my side of the political <laughs> spectrum, <laughs> probably, because the Miami Herald is also very, very uh, advocacy. Um, but it has been a big institution. It has been a big institution for many years, and they are just selling. Uh -huh. And the control, even though the family that have run it is still there, they don't have that much control anymore. Um, oh, the other was the, that newspaper are definitely investing, investing online. You can see, you can see the, the, this. Uh, how is this going to? Uh, result, if they, they are going to survive online or not. I think it's new, it's pretty new, but they are definitely investing on it. Uh, the implications, my main point, so the emergence of the development of this industry, we want to see it as an industry in economic terms. It cannot be, be fully explained just yes, by looking at uh, uh, economic factors or by class interest. Uh, the sectional interests are the key, are the key to understanding this media. Mm, and uh, the ethnic media fails to account for this media. And the reason why I say fails to account is because the constituencies of this media are part of a labor diaspora. So th they are immigrants. Mm, very different, very different from the African American newspapers, right? Very different from the newspapers in um, New Mexico or the newspapers in, in, even in California. Mm -hmm. So these are these are the media. That's that's pretty much my, my conclusion. These are these are the media of a of a, of a, of a diaspora. And then I'm borrowing another another um, notion, very very interesting notion of a geographer. Um, I really like geography. I wish I were one. <laughs> they are doing very interesting things. Yeah, definitely. Um, Saskia Sassen. And she talks about <coughs> something that she calls counter geographies of globalization. And she said there are counter, because usually they are not recognized 
as in part, as in part of globalization. So that linking of the two labor markets, uh, and uh, they are uh, circuits. So these are alternative, alternative uh, circuits, cross-border circuits for people engaging in economic activity, right? Making a living, making profit, and for governments to secure revenue. In this case, for the Mexican government to secure remittances. Also, these counter geographies has like one leg in the formal economy, so they utilize some, some of the um, institutions of the formal economy, the resources, but another one in the shadow economy. There was one uh, publisher of um, a newspaper in Wilmington, <coughs> El Mundo, who was outed as undocumented, actually, was outed in the mainstream media. Uh -huh. Coverage. There is some coverage, yeah, you get some coverage, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, but it was actually very interesting how the mayor of Wilmington and one of the city council, um, whatever, persons, uh, wrote letters on his behalf mm -hmm. because he was serving the community so, so well, right? Uh, he was deported, as far as I know. I don't know if he came back. He overstayed his visa. Mm -hmm. What happened to the newspaper? Um, question. No. Yeah, you see questions. <laughs> you can see that. <laughs> as far as you know, it doesn't publish anymore, if I remember correctly. Uh -huh. Yes. So I'm wondering if you go back to your the early typology, where you had um, uh, the three types of newspapers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that. So there oh. we go. Yeah. So. Um, <coughs> Given that this is a, a conference paper, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about this typology more generally, because um, I'm not quite sure I understand the distinctions that you're looking to draw here. So it seems to me that for-profit advocacy papers uh, might share a lot in common economically and otherwise with something like an independent company or a business. So I'm wondering if you could just clarify. It's the motives. It's in. It is the motives. It is the motivation, the motivation the for... Motivation for the yeah, the motivation so. before creating creating this enterprise, right. uh, the motivation not only for creating the enterprise but for sustaining it. Okay. Uh, the um, Latino media advertising rate is much lower than the general market advertising rate. Okay. So it's not like it's a huge profitable right. media, and then you only have not only the publishers or the owners of the newspaper, but more than anything, the reporters. The, what? the reporters, the editors, the photographers, the people that work in the newspaper, uh -huh, what they are doing it. Of course, they are making a living, right? But it's a calling. So it's their orientations <laughs> in some way towards these sectional interests that are... To this sectional interest. Really, yeah. To this sectional interest, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Let me yeah. Add, to I guess a follow-up uh -huh. question with that, too. So one of the, I'm trying to think of other work in this area, and I'm, I'm sort of struck by a, a study that I had read a couple years back, which was a study of uh, Spanish language newspapers in the Bay Area. And mm -hmm. one of the findings, this is John Kim, Isabel Alwad, and, and Ted Glasser. Uh, they found that the uh, newspapers that were run by large, uh, say the San Jose Mercury News, uh -huh. your Durham Sun, so professional outlets that found Spanish language newspapers uh -huh. were significantly different in that basically all they were doing was say taking the regular newspaper content and writing it in Spanish as opposed to that advocacy. Uh -huh. I'm wondering uh -huh. if that was also a pattern that you saw here, sort of what were the qualitative differences, at least in the content, um, and whether this was about in some ways just sort of repackaging other content to speak to the Spanish language primarily audience or whether um, you know, you saw significant differences between even those businesses, so that general market newspapers look different than the independent businesses, etc. Yeah, I would say one of, one of the differences is um, mm, if we go to the to the newspapers that are more businesses, they tend to use more news from agencies, news that they don't produce. So it has to do with localism. So it's less local local investment local reporting. Uh -huh. uh, there is one, at least one newspaper here that I don't count, I don't consider a newspaper, and it's basically a conveyor of advertising. 
And he's a chopper. <laughs> well, it's not, on, it's, a, it's not a chopper. It really looks like a newspaper. And it has, it has some news, but the news are, it, the local coverage is minimum. It's minimum. Some, some police notes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> which is the easy to, uh, to cover. Uh -huh. um, are you satisfied with my answer? Are you still? <laughs> I just, I'm struggling because so I'm, I'm trying to think of like, so a for-profit advocacy paper, you know, that, that to me might be a media outlet like Fox News. So Fox News is an advocacy organization for the conservative movement, yet it's highly profitable at the same time. I guess what I'm trying to sort of think about is sort of what's the distinction you can have advocacy, but sometimes advocacy can dovetail with market interests. So how should we think about that? And so sometimes advocacy is a good like marketing plan. Right. Well, I, yeah. At least, at least, sort of, if we look at the cable industry, like MSNBC and Fox News as advocacy journalism organizations, we could debate about that. Are very economically profitable if we think about sort of where audiences are flowing to. And CNN loses out yeah. in that instance. So what I'm saying is that sometimes it will dovetail and that economics will sort of, of you know, dovetail onto sort of the more partisan or Right, right. And, and, and that's the key. That's the key. With these newspapers, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't dovetail. Right. I mean, they, they reporters uh, have a salary or whatever, but it's not like they are right. becoming rich at all or having a, a, great, a great job, you know. Right. Uh -huh. Uh, so they, in many ways, like I say, is not is against the economic interest. That's what it is. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, although I'm not sure MSNBC will do it against its economic interest. I think Murdoch will do it, but I don't. I don't think MSNBC. Lucila, what uh, about the argument that these types of, especially ethnic or minority media, whether and that's at odds with this idea of sectional interest, but they're transitional. There are four groups that are attempting to assimilate, and that one reason that there's a need for these um, minority media outlets is that they're not receiving coverage in mainstream media. So maybe the goal is to increase coverage in mainstream media, so this is no longer needed. This actually comes out of a panel I heard in Chicago at EJMC from um, that included a woman from the, is it Windy City Times in Chicago? <coughs> Anybody? Uh -huh. A GLBT uh -huh. newspaper, very uh -huh. long-standing has been uh -huh. profitable. And so some folks were arguing, well, if there's so much more coverage of the LGBT uh -huh. community, almost where you don't need these things, but that's sad to uh -huh. well, be losing uh, you historic Finish, I'm and sorry. it's not mm -hmm. as though mainstream media is giving any minority mm -hmm. community full mm -hmm. coverage. Mm -hmm. but yeah, and there is there is some overlap. There is some overlap with with this media, especially with with uh, not the business, the ones that are just for the business, but the ones that are more advocacy or social justice. Some overlap with um, social movements media. What you are saying is a social movement media. So in social movement media, fulfill a function, and it's not necessary anymore, like the movement, mm -hmm. right? right okay. So it is. Um, so are you saying, will, will this ever uh, disappear? It would be transitionally? Well, I hope it will be transitionally, you know? I hope that we will not need our own media, right? That we will be so part of the mainstream society. Mm -hmm. Is that what you hope? Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I hope. But, but it's uh, within what is called cultural citizenship. Uh -huh. So we are Americans, as anybody else. But we do speak Spanish, right? And we eat whatever we want, and we have this music, and yeah, we have, yeah, yeah, we can be both things, right? But we are part of the mainstream. We are not others, right? And not subject to discrimination and all. Uh, can you speak a bit about language then? If you were moving mm -hmm. into mainstream, then uh -huh. would we need a Spanish language press? Well, as far as we have these circuits. This, as far as we we have, we have a labor right. How, as how, as far as we have, immigrants from Latin America coming, the Spanish language media will be necessary, mm -hmm. in that in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, new, new, new generations, as new generations. But the second, third generation, 
and by the way, how we say second and third generation immigrant, right? Fourth generation immigrant. You keep being an immigrant, <laughs> no matter how long you're here, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. um, no, there are, there are now many, many options in, in English. Uh, there are three uh. channels, Mundos, <laughs> three um, cable channels. Mundo, CTV, what is the other one? Uh, well, there is another one that is for youth, that are catering to Latino youth. And, and it's in English or with some Spanglish, you know, uh -huh. with some Spanglish. Uh -huh. So that's interesting, uh -huh. you're catering to Latino youth, not through Spanish language. How do you, I mean, what does that catering to Latino youth mean? That would be, I'd love to see what, how they um, identify these groups. If it's not by language. If it's not by language. Or so what uh -huh. you do? Type of music? Well, but it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, there is still, this, it has to do a lot with identity, right? It has to do, um, and the best example of, of, a, of a group that has a very strong identity and it's not linked to language is the Irish. Yeah? So it can become that way. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be bilingual, yes. Uh -huh. Going back to the mainstream media part, can't you argue that there is Spanish version of mainstream media considering the individual names many nights? Yeah. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. It went against yeah. the network. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, so, I'd argue that when you're talking about mainstream broadcast networks, if you don't include Univision, you don't include. You're absolutely right, and I shouldn't use that term um, uh, because the term is general market media, mm -hmm. right? It's general market media as opposed to Univision is mainstream media, but it's, gen it's, it's um, um, mainstream. You're right. The term mainstream media is just as it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. Did you have a question in the back? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, I mean, <coughs> Because I know a lot of the times, um, you know, there's different groups of communities that go to you know, different parts of the southeast, whether it's from northern Mexico or southern right. Mexico. Right, uh huh. Uh -huh. And whether there's a difference that you've seen culturally still in the community that media outlets, whether they're more activist based or profit based. So uh huh. Uh huh. Right, well, the value of this media is being local. So the value is, is the coverage of the, of the local communities. Um, and over 60%, I think 67% is Mexican. Uh -huh. So it is, it is dominated in that sense. But interestingly, and this is just anecdotally, um, there are many non-Mexicans, many Colombians, many Peruvians, uh -huh, uh, and uh, as reporters, uh -huh, Spaniards. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Yeah. Then why is that? And I guess I have two questions. One is that so how? Why is radio so important? I know you did some of your early work in radio. Is is it the same kinds of uses here in the uh -huh. United States? And and uh, secondly, I forgot the second part. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The, other, the second part was about newspapers and how interesting it is that. I would have expected an even even more significant decline in newspapers in this period when all the English language newspapers had such decline. And thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for bringing that up because I didn't give you the national context. The national context is uh, according to the Association of National Association of um, Hispanic Newspapers, 800 and I think 34 newspapers weeklies. Uh -huh. There are only 29 dailies nationally, and then over 800 weeklies. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the fact that this local newspaper got those awards is remarkable, yeah. right? Um, 
but the weeklies yeah the weeklies actually did very i mean relatively well during the depression and have been doing very well as compared as compared to the daily the dailies are, are, are not doing as well and as compared to the english language media it's a success story the, the spanish language weeklies uh, you tell our students I do tell them that. Yeah, <laughs> I do tell them that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the reason is obviously that they are fulfilling a very important function. I mean, people buy them, don't buy them, but read them, right? And radio. And radio. Uh, I think nobody knows. I think no. I think nobody knows. I haven't seen any research that definitely says this is the reason. Um, some people argue that because we are more of an, uh, an oral culture. Uh -huh. uh, but it, it has, to do, has to do also with uh, the type of work that um, especially working, close, close, uh, working class Latinos do, that you can actually have the radio when you are working. That's, that's another reason. Uh, our attachment to the music. Uh, I don't know. What do you Latinos think? <laughs> Why is the most important? Uh -huh. um, in 2006, there were some national uh, demonstrations, right, of immigrant for immigrant rights, and uh, the uh, radio personalities were at the forefront of, of the movement because they are really political figures. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? I would follow up just a simple question. I noticed when you had the numbers up there, uh -huh. a lot of the loss in 2010 was in Atlanta. It seemed like seven newspapers. Yeah. Right, seven right, right. I don't know why, Alza. I don't know why, Alza, because this is, I mean, this is the first research that we have been doing and nobody else has been doing it. Like I say, it seems that uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, and Raleigh had been more, more, um, um, Latinos have been more organized. So there has been more of a community. And that is in other research also, not related to media or to anything, uh, but related to Mm, Latinos in, in Atlanta, how there were conflicts mm -hmm. with the groups. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Sometimes uh, in my research, when I want to get a big effect, I, I say that the media are not really about information at all, to get it. And I say the media is about community. Right. So especially mm -hmm. if that's true of horizontal media, mm -hmm. which is what you're defining. I wonder if your data don't fit my model. They're really about community, aren't they? I yeah. mean, the people who are producing them are creating or finding or trying to identify community. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, 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 key for, it's key for the community. It's key for creating a community. Um, you are probably are familiar with, with the Anderson research, imagine it communities, right? that actually was the newspapers in Europe that uh, uh, created a sense of, of being, being a, like a state, like a nation, right? That connected people that were separated, separated uh, spatially. Mm -hmm. So in the newspapers that you're looking at, is there much reaching out beyond the borders of the Hispanic community to other topics? Did it make much of a connection? with, say, general political economic topics in the United States, or do they primarily make it from those topics as related to the Hispanic community? It is as related to the Hispanic community. It's those news that will not be in the mainstream media. Uh -huh. And at the local level, so those small events that will not make it in, into the big news. Is mm -hmm. there very much in those newspapers about the Catholic Church? Yes, yes, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and there are then the social justice justice papers. Thank you for bringing that up. There are a lot of religious, so the, the motivation is religious. It's a religious motivation for social justice in the Catholic way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs>
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. To all of you who come.